This morning our text is uh, from James 1, verses 16 through 17. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Beloved, I had to stand for the reading of God's word because it is him speaking to us. When our king calls us into his presence, we come humbly and reverently. So give his word to your new attention. James 1, verses 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Let's pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also do it. That as the word is preached, the man would be removed. My voice would become its own. And that your voice, through your word, would be everything that is nourishing beneficial, life-giving to your people. I pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Be seated. Well, it has been uh, over a month since our last sermon in the Epistle of James. In that time, uh, we had the pleasure of hearing many different sermons from many faithful in, and our presbyter has been very thankful for that. But it's been interesting, I don't know if you noticed, but I'm fairly certain that not one of those sermons came from the same book of the Bible. And yet, they were all proclaiming the same thing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that just goes show, to show both the incredible depth and unity of God's word. But now this morning, we are back in the Epistle of James, so I think it's wise, before we begin, to give a quick rundown of where we've been so far. What is James teaching us so far? And up to this point, James has been exhorting the 12 tribes in dispersion, which I've labored to explain were Christians, not the actual 12 tribes of Israel, to meet every tribe with joy. And we do this relying upon God for wisdom. And that's because it is God who is, by these trials, testing our faith. He's testing our faith and giving us the ability to stand fast through those trials. You see, relying on Him keeps us from wandering. Which leads James to cap off this exhortation with a glorious promise that those who are able to remain steadfast and stand these tests of God will receive the blessed crown of life. But again, there is no doubt up to this point where these tests have come from. They have come from God. And so we are encouraged by James to remain steadfast under these trials. And the idea is that the trials that we have been going through and are going through will not be the only trials. There will be more. And in our weaknesses, we have already seen in our flesh that we can often get discouraged. And when we get discouraged, we often begin to blame God for placing us in difficult situations. We blame Him for the temptations that we face on a daily basis, which is, of course, blasphemy. So James reminds his readers where that temptation really originates. It originates in our hearts, because it is our hearts that are prone to wonder. And so with that quick rundown, we're through verse 15. Now, as we begin verse 16, James really focuses in on what he's been hinting at this whole time. That these trials, the tribulations themselves, 
are not only from God, they are gifts from God. Now that's not to say that trials and tribulations in themselves are easy to deal with. They're, they're often overwhelming. I mean, we've all had ordeals of great difficulty that we've had to endure in our lives, even the youngest amongst us. The people in Uvalde, Texas, especially the parents of the children that were killed in that mass shooting, are painfully aware of the devastation that comes from, from sin, from the tragedy of sin in this world. But here's the thing. Painful as they are, and they are incredibly painful, they're not eternal. They're temporal. They are, as Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, but light momentary affliction. As we look at them in the scope of eternity, they are the blink of an eye. But have you ever noticed how emotion can cloud our thoughts? Our reactions to these things? How in the heat of the moment, you can say and do things that you normally wouldn't consider. If you have kids, this is very apparent. It's probably a very familiar idea. You've had a long, hard day at work. Your boss yelled at you for something that wasn't even your fault, by the way. You just want to sit down for a minute, minute and enjoy some peace and quiet, finally. And what happened? Here. You hear that ruckus coming from the playroom, and you get up, and you're thinking to yourself, somebody's going to get it. It's going to happen. It's nothing out of the ordinary. Tim took the toy that I was playing with, telling him to give it back. Lucy called me stupid. <laughs> Normal kid stuff. But because we're tired and angry, we make an irrational decision. And one thing leads to another, and the next thing you know, everybody's around. Go to your room forever, you're never coming out again, no toys for a week, or some other ridiculously disproportionate punishment. In short, we've thought wrongly about the trial. We've thought wrongly about the trial that God just sent into our lives, and so we've reacted wrongly. But the reason we think wrongly about our trials the reason we try to blame God for our tribulations, the reason we're tempted to sin, is that we wander from the truth. We react as if the threat is what happens in this world. That's the most significant thing. When in fact, the real threat is that which affects eternity. Not this temporary fallen. great blessing from God. He is the giver of life. And yet we will possess, we possess now, eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so what is it? What can hound us straight to hell or guide us to glory? Our conception of God. Or put it another way, what we believe about God. As A.W. Tozer tells us, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And so James tells us, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Which, of course, implies that you can be deceived. Or perhaps put it another way, that you will be deceived. But how often do we consider that risk? How often do we wonder if we're in error? Do we wonder at all? To even pose these questions is tricky. It's a difficult to topic to discuss or to preach on, not because people may get offended by it. They have, that absolutely will happen. Because we don't like to face our sin. I don't like to face my sin. We don't like to face it in any form that we commit it. So we, as ministers of God's word, and that's not just me, 
want to smash, I want to show you. I always have to address to address sin in all its forms. Because as it has been said, sin is the strength of death. And the death of strength. Now this is a tri tricky topic because for the sake of the bride of Christ, it must be handled delicately. James knows that. Which is why here he reminds us that we are not only brothers, but beloved brothers. He loves them. And in dealing with error, as we've been discussing often in our institutes class, we should use tenderness and compassion in the vast majority of cases. Although sometimes it is appropriate to be a little more direct. As Mark Twain says, put the very bluntly, never argue with stupid people. They will drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. <laughs> so we must exercise the servant as well. And that's what James is doing here. Although he has the authority to command and be very direct in his correction, he deals meekly with them and through them with us. What do I mean by meekness? Because if we are called to be meek ourselves, and we are in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 5, then we need to have an accurate understanding of what we are to endure. Do we mean weakness? Because so many people use it synonymously. Because we all know that Jesus himself was uh, meek. But was he weak? By the way, many Christians today respond to those who exhibit strength in, in, in an absurd way. You would think by the way they respond to those who are exhibiting any type of strength that Jesus was weak. But in short, the difference between being weak and being meek, say that five times fast, is twofold. It compromises both comprises both of ability and consideration. But the difference between being weak and meek is that weakness and meekness both have to do with your ability and your consideration in the moment. Maybe I can put it this way. You cannot be a man of peace unless you have the capacity to do incredible violence. If you're not capable of violence, you're not a peaceful man. You're harmless and effectively worthless. Likewise, if you're capable of violence, but use it in a manner that is ungodly, you're nothing but a bully. So in other words, if you can do something and choose not to because it would be inappropriate for some reason, for some reason that you have deeply considered, then you are meek. If you can't do anything and don't, then you're simply weak. Jesus was not weak. He was meek. Because our Lord and Savior is omnipotent. But he's also omniscient and omnibenevolent. He was meek. He was gentle and low. He has every ability to destroy the wicked. Those who questioned him, those who mocked him, those who arrested and beat and crucified him, and yet, time and time again, what does he do? He implores the people to believe in him. He prayed to the Father while on the cross to not hold that sin against those who were responsible for it. Beloved, that is meekness. Although he had the power to destroy the wicked where they stood, he didn't even speak in his own defense. Like a sheep led to the slaughter, like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Our Lord is meek. He is, as Matthew 11, 29 says, gentle and lowly. And so James is here in this instance 
showing that he learned from the example of his older brother. He's being weak in his friendship. Because he, is, uh, as well, had the authority to command and speak very directly, but instead he was bold. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. In other words, do not wonder. But why is this even necessary? Beloved, it is astounding how easily we can be blinded to our own ignorance and arrogance. How we can just go along to get along. How we can believe a lie just because the majority of people agree with it. But as Booker T. Washington said, a lie doesn't become true. Wrong doesn't become right. And evil doesn't become good just because it's accepted by a majority. Beloved, we can be deceived. We can wander from the path of righteousness so easily. And that's what this word means, planaste, translated here as deceived in James 1.15. It means to wander. Well, really, there are two ways that we can interpret this word. And the first is to lead astray. That's the active usage of the word, which, of course, is also something we should not do. If our own thoughts of God are unbiblical, unorthodox, and heretical, then we should repent and cease to even speak these blasphemies, much less teach them to others and lead others astray by our delusions. Technically, you can believe whatever you want. Technically. Foolish as that may be. Keep the lie to yourself. We were talking this morning about Scientology frequently. Keep it to yourself. Now we'll see shortly that every good gift comes from God. God created all things out of nothing, and so nothing is ours except maybe a lie. As Augustine said, no one should consider anything his own except perhaps a lie, since all truth is from him who said, I am the truth. So if you're telling any lie, especially lie concerning God, keep it to yourself. Now these lies, these delusions, these false ideas of who God is, they're from you. And to teach others your lies is death. It's death to you and to those who may believe you. Whereas James puts it later in his epistle, how great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life set on fire by hell. Now that applies to everything we say. But how much more to doctrine? How much more to what we think about God? So be very careful if you seek to lead others astray because you will answer to the king. If I can paraphrase Christ in Matthew 23, 15, woe to you, Christian feminists and liberal theologians, hypocrites. Where you post on Facebook and Twitter and make your viral TikTok videos to convert faithful Christians. And when they believe your lies, you make them twice as much a child of hell as yourselves. But that's the active use of the word planaste, to lead astray. But the passive meaning of the word is what James is intending here. In this context, it means to wonder. And this is an idea taken from a very common metaphor in scripture, shepherding. Not from the perspective of the shepherd, however, but from the perspective of the sheep. You see, sheep are, as we were discussing in our fellowship time between Sunday school and sermon, sheep are not. Sheep are not that smart. If they were human, we would say that they lack street smarts. It's a normal occurrence for them, for example, to wander off and wind up in the most, most precarious of situations. 
and one right after another, there's actually a really famous YouTube video where a shepherd goes into a ditch, pulls the sheep out, sets it on, and it's a, it's a long, arduous process. He sets it finally on the dry ground, and the sheep goes boop, right back into the ditch. That's what they do. And yes, we're the sheep in this metaphor. Because we can and do make the most ridiculous decisions, especially regarding our thinking about God. So this word is often used in scripture to denote errors in practice, or going off from the word of God as the standard and measure of truth, which we most commonly express as being deceived, which is why the translators chose to render it here, do not be deceived. But in applying this word in its passive use, James is essentially telling us this. I know, beloved, beloved brothers, that we are prone to wonder. But do not wonder. Do not wonder from the word of God in the accounts that you have of him there. Do not stray into erroneous opinions and go off from the standard of truth the things which you have received from the Lord Jesus and by the direction of his spirit in his revealed will. Do not listen to the enticing words of Satan. And make no mistake, if anyone, even if, and maybe even especially if they are in the majority, is thinking or teaching what is not true about God, then they are sons of the devil. So do not listen to them. Do not wonder. Do not wonder from the truth. Do not compromise with them. Do not negotiate with them because it is not safe negotiating with the devil. He will lead you astray. And you will begin to wonder. You will turn from the truth. Beloved, let the wicked run headlong into that ditch time and time again. That ditch of false perceptions of God, if they so will. You stand firm upon the foundation of Christ, upon his revealed will, because the truth, as it is in Scripture, is this, that God is not, and in fact cannot be, the author or creator of anything that is evil, but must be acknowledged as the cause and spring of everything that is good. That's James's point. That no matter what trials and tribulations you've been dealing with in this life, no matter how unfair your condition may appear compared to others, no matter how tempted you are to turn from Christ, God is not the author of that evil. He is not the creator of sin. In fact, it's just the opposite. Because every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Now, in most sermons and commentaries, you'll hear that these gifts are primarily all the good things that we get in this life. And I have primarily used it that way myself. And so I was forced to look at the context while preparing for this sermon. Now it's not wrong to say that God graciously gives us every good gift that we have in this life. I think you can easily prove that from Scripture, and we'll get more to that in a minute. You just can't primarily prove it from this text. Why do I say that? Well, what James, what, what has James been talking about up to this point? Because we have to keep in mind what R.C. Sproul said was the first, second, and third rule of hermeneutics. Context, context, context. So what is that context? Well, in verse 3, James tells us that these trials of various kinds are to test your faith. In verse 5, he says, if we lack wisdom, we are to ask God and he will give it. We will have the wisdom that is from above. Then in verse 12, there is the promise that we will be given the crown of life for remaining steadfast rather than giving in to our temptations. 
And then finally, in the verse we just covered, verse 16, we are warned not to wander, not to be deceived. And what do all of these? Faith, wisdom from above, the blessed crown of life, that is eternal salvation, and wandering or not being deceived had an end. Doctrine, true doctrine, right thinking and right belief about God. And so I think that when James tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, he's referring primarily to Christ and to Christ preached in the gospel. To the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints that James tells us in verse 3. Because it is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the perfect gift. It is in Christ himself that we are given every good gift, that we are made to progress in our spiritual life, the end of which is perfection and eternal life. This is the gift of God in Christ. It is in him that we are made new. And as we are made new by his grace, we are given every good gift. We are given a new mind and a new heart, new views and new principles, new tastes and new affections, new likes, new dislikes, new fears, new joys, new sorrows, new love to things we once hated and new hatred to things we once loved, new thoughts of God, of ourselves, of the world, and the life to come the new thoughts of salvation. That is the application of this text. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. But it's only the primary application. There is a secondary application here, and it is what we've all heard before as the primary. The secondary application is to remind us that everything we have our house, our family, our job, our health. All of those things are from God. And so, in light of that realization, we should be humble. We should be humble. Because if we are not careful, if we wander from the truth, then we will become proud. We'll become proud in our own hearts and begin to think that God is keeping something, something good back from us, as if we deserve more than we have. Does that sound familiar? This is exactly the temptation that Satan used against Adam and Eve. And they believed it. They wandered from the truth and were deceived into grasping after what was not theirs to have. You see, everything good is from above, as James tells us. But that which is evil is from below. But Adam and Eve became proud, and in their pride, they believed a lie. In their pride, they wondered why they didn't have more. They lost everything. Beloved, a proud man complains that he doesn't have enough. And how often do we complain that we don't have enough? But a humble man. One who understands their sin before a holy God wonders why he has so much. But whatever we have, whatever gifts we possess are from God, and so we have to avoid two temptations here. In our attempt to keep from driving into one ditch, we may overcorrect and wind up in the other, just as wrong and just as sinful ditch. The first ditch, and we'll call it the ditch on the right, I guess I should go this way, the ditch on the right is to say that all of these things we have are of the world. And so we should not enjoy them. If we enjoy these material things at all, in fact, then we are dishonoring Christ in some way, as if it's idolatry to enjoy things in this life. That's the ditch on the right. But the other ditch, the left ditch, on the other hand, is just as deadly. And it's that we enjoy these gifts disproportionately 
and inappropriate. In other words, the second ditch, which we must also avoid, treats the gifts as if they are the end, as if they are the most important thing, the ditch of idolatry. And so we have to be careful here, because one ditch devalues the gifts given by the gift giver, and the other ditch overvalues the gifts as if they are the giver. So how are we to rightly consider the gifts? Who knows? As we wake up in the morning, humbly thank God for the gift of life, that he kept you safe throughout the week. As we're comfortable in our homes with air conditioning on a hot day, we enjoy it knowing that we do not deserve it and in fact, in fact deserve the flames of hell. As we sit at dinner and watch our children enjoy the food that we've worked hard to put on the table, we praise God that he has given us a job, the strength and intelligence to do that job, and that we are given a fair wage for an honest day's work and for the food that is purchased. We praise him for the children that he has given us to raise and teach and feed. We praise him for the life of our youth, for the one flesh union that has been the means to bring so much of this back. And why? Because they are gifts. And they are given to us by our Heavenly Father. And so they should be enjoyed. It's just that those things shouldn't be our primary focus. As I quoted in other settings, we are to enjoy everything in God. And God in everything. They just shouldn't be our everything. And we do this by humbling ourselves before God, knowing that Christ is our everything. And as we enjoy him, everything else falls into its proper place. Because in him, we are completely satisfied. The proud, though, the proud continue to grasp at everything else. And they're never satisfied. Now, I'm not the first to recognize this. Pagans uh, have recognized this truth for centuries. For example, Cicero said it this way, the evil was not in bread and circuses per se, but in the willingness of the people to sell their rights as free men for full bellies and the excitement of gains, which would serve to distract them to make them wonder from the other human hunger, which bread and circuses can never be. when a pagan speaks truth, that truth is from God. It is all truth. It's God's truth. Things of this world can never fully appease us. But we can enjoy them. Only the gift giver can satisfy our deepest longings and needs. But that doesn't mean we can't enjoy the gifts he's given and should enjoy the gifts he's given. And that, beloved, is an amazing truth. So do not wonder from it. Do not be deceived. But you know what's even more amazing? What's more amazing is that this truth is not just for today. It has always been and will always be the truth. Because these gifts, this truth, comes down from the Father of lights. They come down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now there's a lot that can be said about this small little phrase. But what we're seeing here is an analogy that points to a very important attribute of God. And that's his immutability. God does not change. Malachi 3.16 for I, the Lord, do not change. And what James is showing us here is that he, God, is consistent. He's consistent in his goodness, in his beauty, in his truth. He's as consistent in those things as the sun is in its shining. 
Listen to how Matthew Henry unfolds this idea. God is the Father of lights, the visible light of the sun, and that heavenly bodies is from him. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Thus God is at once represented as the creator of the sun and, in some respects, compared to it. As the sun is the same in its nature and influence, though the earth and clouds oft interposing, make it seem varying us, varying to us, by its rising and setting and by its different appearances, or its entire withdrawal, when the change is not in it, the change is not in the sun, so God is unchanging. And our changes and shadows are not from any mutability or shadowy alterations in him, but from ourselves. So what's he saying? He's saying as the sun continuously shines, even if a thunderstorm passes before it and seems dark for a moment, even as it goes down every evening and it is dark, the sun has not ceased its shining. Those are the trials and tribulations. Beloved, what the sun is in its nature, God is in his grace, in his providence, in his glory. Only infinitely more so. But not only infinitely more so, but for all eternity. You will not only have the ability to enjoy the gifts of the now, uh -huh. not only the ability to enjoy a perfect gift as you are adopted in Christ and have life eternal now, but you will be able to enjoy the face to face for all eternity. When we are there 10,000 years, it will only just be us. For all eternity, we will enjoy him because he is the perfect gift that came down from heaven. Beloved, that is the truth. That is the truth of do not be deceived. Do not be deceived by what others may tell you. Do not be deceived by your own heart. But believe the truth of God's word. And do not wonder. Do not wonder from the truth. Let's pray. Oh Lord, you are the giver of every good gift. And we are humbled by your grace that you give us the things that we so often take for granted, but especially because you have given us the perfect gift of your only begotten Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we go out into the world, may we give thanks for and enjoy these gifts in Christ. May we enjoy everything in God and God in Pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.